Hello, welcome back to The Independent Pianist. I'm your host, Cole Anderson, and today we are continuing with my survey of Brahms' short piano works with Opus 118, number four. There is so much detail packed into a very small amount of space in this piece. You can clearly see the legacy of Beethoven and the other Viennese classical composers in Brahms's compositional style in a piece like this. Every single little detail which he sets up in the beginning of the piece has some kind of payoff later on and some kind of through line that connects uh, to the very end of the work. So don't be fooled by its miniature dimensions. This is a drama on the grandest possible scale. My impression practicing it this time is that it is indeed the hardest piece from this set to really learn well. Even if the perhaps the ballad the last one, Opus 118, number three, is a little bit more difficult, physically speaking. This one is very difficult to parse and figure out and to get the right voicing. Very, very complex. So there are two main things that are going on in this piece that you can look for if you're trying to analyze the work. Uh, the idea of a canon and also an idea of inversion going on throughout. So you can hear at the beginning that the right hand and the left hand are in a kind of rhythmical canon. So first the right hand has the triplets, then the left hand, and they kind of overlap in this way. Now beyond that though, throughout the piece there's this idea that the right hand and the left hand are generally in some kind of free inverse relationship. So as you can see at the beginning here, the right hand has the triplet pattern starting with a downward interval and the left hand starts with an upward interval. And this is played out in many different ways as we go through the piece. Now beyond this simple canonic idea, you'll also see that there's this pattern of accents trading back and forth from left hand to right hand, and in particular this outlines the drop of an octave. So from C to C, and then F to F, G to G on this first line, and that can also continues consistently throughout this opening section. This accent motive kind of creates a connection between the two separate parts for the right hand and the left hand. And in fact, later on in the last section in the piece, it's going to be heard in one voice. It also forms the basis for the melodic material in the B section, which is coming up. In many ways, this is a very experimental work. It's very fragmentary. It's very non-melodic in a sense. There's no melody to speak of. There's just these held accented notes and these little snippets of motivic material with the triplets. However, in the next line of music, we do get a little bit of lyricism. The music just very briefly kind of blossoms into real melodic material, still with an exact canon between the right hand and left hand. So we hear that the right hand leads and the left hand follows with the exact same music in the tenor. So this little phrase is quite important because this is going to blossom into a magnificent kind of peroration in the final A section. It's really a grand idea that he's setting up here in its, in its uh, incipient form. So this idea of some kind of a rhythmic canon and inversion, it carries on in this continuation material where the triplets actually blossom out. They cover the whole measure in this section. But you can see that the basic pattern is inverted in the right hand and it's also a two triplet eighths offset. So there is kind of a hemial effect here. We hear the left and right hands going in sets of two, whereas before the meter was divided into two groups of three, here it's divided into three groups of two eighth notes. So Brahms's favorite technique of hemiola is on display here.
And when we reach the middle section, you'll hear that this same accent motive, the dropping octave accent motive, proliferates even more than before and is in fact the basis for this entire middle section. And this brings us to an interesting point, which is Brahms's pedal marking. Uh, Brahms has very carefully written uh, pedal to be changed on every single measure. And this is actually very rarely followed by performers. And in fact, I don't even do it in this recording. I ended up doing what most people do, which is I pedaled every two measures instead of every measure. Now, I can see why Brahms wrote the pedal marking this way, though. If you listen to an example of what it sounds like when you pedal every single measure, it forces you to play in a slightly slower, more measured manner, and it perhaps emphasizes the octave dropping motive even more. On the other hand, it's very understandable that people want to alter this pedaling because when you allow the pedal to hold for two measures, it gives a much freer and lyrical sound to this passage. So I did end up going for that pedaling instead of pedaling every single measure, but it's hardly finished in my mind. If I played it again, I might decide to do Brahms's pedaling. I, I haven't really decided finally about how this should be done. In fact, it's probably not something that you can even decide finally. But it's very important to notice that that pedaling is there. So if you do decide to change it and uh, pedal less often, uh, you should you should know what what is in Brahms's original score and why he put it there. There's another very interesting detail in this middle section which is usually missed. Uh, that is, at a certain point, Brahms introduces this kind of sighing motive. He develops the octave dropping motive by having this kind of sigh, this two note sigh, as you can see right here. But then he also inverts that idea. He has a two note rising motive, and at a certain point, he puts the two note falling and rising motive into the lower voice in the right hand and left hand. So you can see here how the right hand is divided into two voices and so is the left hand, and it's actually the lower voice which is moving instead of the upper voice. And I think this is a wonderful little detail and it's worth bringing out. It's worth trying to voice the lower voices a little louder than the upper voice. Uh, again, this is a detail that you very rarely, if ever, hear, but I think it's a very telling one because it just shows how much detail Brahms is putting into the part writing. And when we come back to the A section, there's a wonderful example right at the recap of, uh, of something that Schoenberg would have called developing variation. Not to say that this piece is exactly a variation form, but the music, when it is repeated, is transformed by what we heard up to this point. So this idea of the hands crossing in the B section, as you might have noticed, you have to cross your hands in order to play all that material, it continues. When the theme comes back, the left and right hands now cross over each other, and it's a very, very dramatic moment when this happens. And Brahms continues these ideas right up to the very end, so even the final chords continue this idea of some kind of rhythmic canon between the left hand and the right hand. It's really interesting. Even here, he doesn't relax the motivic structure of the piece. It's that tightly constructed. So it is an amazing piece. A very interesting, dark, restless, anxious kind of music. Not necessarily my favorite among the collection, but I think that it does work extremely well in the context of an integral performance of the set. This is one of the sets that definitely gains from being played entire with all the pieces together, although you can certainly excerpt numbers from it as well. So I hope you enjoyed that little conversation about this piece. Stay tuned for the complete performance. Also, please consider supporting the channel if you can financially. You can do that easily at www 
uh, patreon.com forward slash independent pianist. And thank you to all of my faithful Patreon supporters. I couldn't do this channel without you. And if you don't feel you can support the channel financially right now, just hit the like button, the subscribe button, and come back next week for some more great music.